everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I'm back by popular demand. We've got Rocker Mike back this morning. How are you doing today, Mike? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Bryce? Glad to be here. I know you just did a fa I know this is uh we're, we're recording this it's about 10 30 on Tuesday morning but you just got off with Shanti our friend Shanti over from Aquarius Rising Africa what a fantastic yes. episode that was guys I will link that in the description box below so you can also make sure to check out Mike on Shanti's channel and this is the thing Shanti and I were talking about this off camera yesterday like the son of Sam case there's so many layers to this case like you had a podcast for two and a half years just talk there's so many corners and crevices and shadows to this case that is absolutely fascinating and Mike something I kind of wanted to talk about because off camera you and I've had a lot of conversations off camera and you say things sometimes that I like quickly write down because it's stuff that I have not heard in this case before and I kind of wanted to focus on some of that today which is just basically the occultism in New York City in the 1970s. And again, right. guys, if you're new to the channel, if this is your first time clicking on, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I will be placing all of our prior episodes down in the description box below in case you don't know why occultism would have anything to do with Son of Sam. Um, I would say you might be living under a rock if you, you don't know that that's a, that's kind of a, a, a topic yep. associated with the son of Sam. But, um, but yeah, cause you're a New Yorker born and bred and that is such a, um, a, a like a superpower you have with this case because you, there are certain cultural things that you're just going to know. And, and I've said this multiple times and pick up on that someone who's not from New York probably might not know or would ever pick up on. Um, so where do you want to start with this, Mike? Well, I'll just agree with you. I'll, I'll right there. I'll agree with you that it's you know a New York story, okay, by every definition of the word, um, and it takes place in the boroughs, okay, not Manhattan. Okay? So, what's a borough for people who? Because that's a very specific New York um, word. So, for people who right. are not familiar with New York or the United States, what would a borough in a city be? Okay, well, well, okay. Uh, there's five boroughs in New York City. You have Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. And that encompasses what's known as New York City. Now, wasn't always that way. You go back to the 1800s, these things were all separate, okay? Yeah. But they became one city, I think, in the late 1800s or so. Brooklyn, at one point, was its own city, okay? But the five boroughs encompass what's known officially as New York City. Now, you know, New York is, there's one kind of phenomenon that people don't get when they're outside of New York is that if you're from Brooklyn or you're from Queens, a lot of times you'll say, if you're going into Manhattan, I'm going into the city. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't, yeah I wouldn't. The, you know, people, people yeah. don't understand. Well, aren't you already in the city? Well, native New Yorkers don't view Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, the Bronx, like really the city. Okay, we're in the we're in the, the the we're in the boroughs. Okay, now Manhattan is a borough, but it's also really considered the heart of New York City, New York, New York. Okay, yeah. and with Son of Sam, these happened in the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. Didn't happen in Manhattan. Right. Okay. Probably, probably couldn't have given the amount of hustle and bustle there. Okay. He tended, he t they tended to pick, uh, you know, quieter areas and stuff like that. But you know what? What created the fear so much was that it it, it was happening in these in the boroughs. Okay. It, it wasn't happening. I mean, if it had happened in in Manhattan. It probably would have created fear too, but I, I think he they would have been caught a lot quicker. It's probably a little bit more expected too. Like maybe, yeah, maybe it's yeah. one way to look at it, you know. Uh, and and also, these people were not from the city; they were from the outskirts. Boroughs. Okay, uh, yeah, the boroughs, and even Yonkers, which is not a borough, it's a little bit north of the city. Okay, it's its own city. Okay, so. You know, it, it, it it's 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 interesting from a New York perspective. Yeah. 
And that's exa exactly, that's something that, um, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the layout of New York, but I'm not a New Yorker. And again, that's something, so, you know, I always think of the boroughs as being like neighborhoods. And that's kind of the same thing that happened in Atlanta, too. I think a lot of cities, Atlanta has a lot of different neighborhoods that all kind of came together as the city started to expand to turn into one. So that makes sense to me. Like if, if, if someone was being killed up in Alpharetta, which is a suburb of Atlanta, it might on the news be advertised as an Atlanta murder, but it's Alpharetta. Is a su it's like a suburb. It's like, you know, that crime doesn't happen right. there. You know, it's, it's um. so yeah, that, and you know, I don't know if you noticed this, Mike, but people have said on my, on my shows with you and on Aquarius Rising Africa, they remember being in fear, living in fear during this time. Yeah. I don't know if you were aware of those yeah. comments when I was moderating, even people who weren't in New York, but were watching the news at this time were getting nervous because there was no rhyme or reason to these kills. It, it, it was just, there was no motive. There was no assault. There was no, it was just, you know, run of the mill, salt of the earth, young people that were just right. being shot for no reason. No, it didn't seem to be a reason for it. Exactly. Exactly. It created, you know, the fear was created through the randomness. Yeah. Of it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you see that if you guys haven't seen the docuseries on Netflix, there's great clips from from people even in the 70s of women changing their hair, uh, cutting their hair, bleaching their hair. There's even a funny clip where a woman says, even if the haircut isn't becoming on them, they do it anyway. So you suck yeah, it up, right. be ugly for a summer just to stay alive. You know. So yeah. I mean, you know, my mom changed her hair, okay, and and you know, cut it and lightened it because he was going after brunettes, mm -hmm. okay. Um, one thing too is is that uh, you know. I always say that the, the, the real New Yorkers are in the boroughs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you don't get, you know, I mean, in Manhattan, of course, there's people born and bred in Manhattan. Rob Rossi on my podcast is born and bred out of Hell's Kitchen. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but less and less of that these days. Okay. What you have in Manhattan and even in Brooklyn and some other areas you have this like very transient transplanted crowd uh in the 70s you had less of that there were more native new yorkers right in the city in those days but manhattan was always a place that there were transient people uh to get the f i would always you know i've had people over the years say um you know where do i go when i come to new york well come to brooklyn come to queens queens is the most diverse borough out of all five OK, you know, you could take a ride on the seven train and one subway stop to the other is a different kind of neighborhood, different kind yeah. of food, different kind of culture. OK, and we all live together, packed in like sardines. And, you know, it's it's just how we do it, you know, and you'll always get the flavor of New York in the boroughs yeah. more than Manhattan. That makes sense. It's so international nowadays. And it makes sense, too, because. You know, the world's so much smaller than it was in the 70s. People probably, you know, if you were going to travel, even in within the United States, it was a bigger deal than it is now. People can just hop a plane, you know, every day, you know, pretty quickly. And so that, that does make a lot of sense to me. Again, Atlanta is a, a lot of people that live outside of Atlanta don't consider Atlanta to be a city in the South. They consider it to, to not be part of the South because there's so many yeah. different. But you do have those old school people that are Atlanta born and bred, very Southern. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense to me. New York has such a rich history. I love the New York history. I love studying about the, the, the like we were just talking about the child strike of 1899, where these freaking cocaine addicted smoking eight year olds shut down the freaking city. Like, that's pretty incredible to, to be the descendant of that. Like, you can't if you're a descendant of one of those kids. <laughs> No one's going to mess with you, you know? So that's the blood you got run through your veins. So there is quite, you know, and I often think as an American, even though I'm not from New York, as an American, New York City is kind of like a, a, a pride. It's, a, it's a, a source of pride for many Americans because it's such a powerful city and there's so it's a wealth of opportunity. It's 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 um it's a beautiful, you know, the, the, the thing about the lights and the energy. And, and so even for people who aren't from cities, from New York City as Americans, will take kind of pride in that being ours, you know, as, as Americans. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it, I love the history of New York. And so I can understand what you're saying though, that these boroughs, there's, there's a different flavor when it's coming from the boroughs versus Manhattan. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so you were telling me, I've got, I mean, I was like scrambling down notes. Should we talk about, is it the magical child store? Was that what it was called? In okay. New York? Well, 
I'll give you a little background on that. Okay. Um, the Magical Child was a was a store in Manhattan. Okay, owned by a gentleman named Herman Slater. Okay, um, he prior to that store that this store opened in the mid seventies. Okay, prior to that he had an occult store in Brooklyn called the Warlock Shop. Okay, okay in, Bro in the Brooklyn Heights area. Now, just to go back to that for a second, that was in the early seventies. All right. It was an occult bookstore. And at the time, there was a heavy occult presence in Brooklyn, particularly that area, Brooklyn Heights. OK, uh, Brooklyn Heights. There was certain covens. There was also a process church of the final judgment uh, presence there. OK. Um, and it was a hangout for, for places for people that were into this stuff. Now, you know, occultism has always been around in New York City. It's nothing new, okay? Um, you can go back to the podcast I did on Samuel Untermeyer and the connections he had with Aleister Crowley, okay, who came to America in 1914 on the Lusitania, okay, two years before it was sunk, and uh, basically came here with books to sell on the occult, Uh starting the OTO and being a member of the Golden Dawn prior to that. Uh, he was a force to be reckoned with in New York City in the occult world. Right. Okay. Uh, check out my Samuel Antemaya podcast on that. Um, then, you know, through the, you know, through the rest of the 20th century, there was all kinds of things. Um, Harry Houdini, for instance. Okay. Har Harry yeah. Houdini, uh, the famous magician had interest in the occult. And also when he died, his wife spent years yeah. publicly doing seances. Yep. 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 Trying to speak to him. Now I've actually, I've actually been to his grave. Okay. In Brooklyn. Oh. Okay. And it's very cool. Cause his last name was Weiss. Okay. And the grave says Weiss. And then there's a little thing underneath that says about Harry Houdini, but it's AKA. a big fan. Yeah, it's right. It's like a big family grave that says Weiss, and it's right off of Cypress Hill Street in Brooklyn, in a, in a big cemetery right there. That whole area is nothing but cemeteries. But anyway, uh, I've sat at his grave. I remember with a buddy of mine who drank a six pack, <laughs> just <laughs> talking about Harry Udini. But what used to happen is uh, he died in the twenties, and going for years after he died, once a year, usually on Halloween, his wife would would have a public seance. It would be on the radio. Okay. This was before television. That's okay, confidence would, to do that on the radio. You got to have some yeah, balls. And, you know, I think it, it went on until she was old and couldn't do it anymore. Okay. And, you know, this was something that, you know, people were like into this. They're like, oh, we're going to speak to the dead, you know? Spiritualism. Yeah. Spiritualism well, was big at this point. Yeah. yeah so it was spiritualism. Exactly. And, um, uh, you know, the 1960s saw kind of a resurgence of occult occultism across the world. OK, mm -hmm. and some of it was tied into music. All right. Uh, some of it was tied into uh, certain people, celebrities, things like that. Um, you know, if you look at uh, some music out there in the 60s, then going into the early 70s, bands like Blue Oyster Cult talked about the occultism in their in their lyrics a little bit uh there were people into this and um by the 1970s in new york city it was it was i don't want to say mainstream but it was definitely you know a little bit a little bit below that it was it was something that people were into now you you brought up the magical child when when the warlock shop closed Herman Slater opened it. That was in Brooklyn. He opened up the Magical Child in Manhattan. And uh, I actually had been to this place. Yeah. Okay. In the, in the, in the early nineties, um, you know, I knew people that were into tarot card readings and things like that. And that was a place you would go to buy that stuff. Mm -hmm. But they had an area in the back curtained off that was always mysterious Okay, people would come in there sometimes from the outside. You might be in that store buying a candle, okay? Yeah. And somebody would walk in off the street looking pretty strange 
okay, that were headed right to, back to that back room, okay? Um, I had nothing to do with that stuff, but but yeah. but people did. And uh, it was a hangout in the 70s for people into the occult. And this, where it comes into play a little bit with Son of Sam, a couple of things. Um, when David Berkowitz met the Carr brothers, he was introduced to, I think he knew about the occult, but was introduced to it. And particularly, he was told to buy a satanic Bible. He was told where to get it. He asked, where can I get one? I don't, I don't know. Oh, well, try the magical child in the city. Okay, so he went there and got it. Okay, now this is documented, I believe, with Maury Terry, but it's also documented in a book called Dead Names. Okay, and uh, also in, in, in Dr. Mike Caparelli's new book, Monster Mirror, I think it's discussed a little bit, maybe not so much the magical child, but it's mentioned that he was being introduced to the occult. Um, so it was a hangout, the magical child. And um, for instance, the, per the person that's uh, one person that you could look at who's got some interesting books on the occult is Peter Lavenda. All right. Peter Lavenda went to the same high school as David Berkowitz. He was a little bit older in the Bronx. Okay. And Peter Lavenda uh, hung out at the Warlock shop and eventually had a job, I believe, at Magical Child. So he, you know, and he has said in interviews, you can look them up on YouTube, that people knew about what was going on, that yeah. were hanging out. Yeah. So they know that, and that's what's so fascinating to me. And, and it was a different time because I think, you know, we, of course, I think every place, like we have the Phoenix and the Dragon here in Atlanta. And I go to the Phoenix and the Dragon all the time for things like candles, stuff like that. But I think, especially in like the 70s, people, you know, occult, the word occult just means hidden. You know, and so I think people, it was so much easier to get people. So obviously there's occult stuff that's not bad and there's occult stuff that's really wicked. And I think sometimes people would get manipulated just by this kind of almost this oddity, this, this, this um, sensationalism when it comes to, and they would, when, you know, today in 2024, I think so, Mike, I think about the Phoenix and Dragon, someone can go into the Phoenix and Dragon and they're not going to see a lot of dark stuff because people are more educated now on what, what the occult is whereas back they then get away I, with it. is that what you're saying yeah like they they and they but they could suck people in especially i'm thinking about you know of course i was born in 1983 but i'm thinking about like you know you look at going from like the 1950s through to the 19 let's say beginning 1980s culturally as a world we went through a huge pivot in our um you know from the 1950s where you had the standard we knew who men and we we knew who a, a, what a female was and a male was. We had the standard, you know, mom was at home work, mom was at home taking care of the kids, the leave it to beaver, you know, the you know, the the, right. the berries of the world. And then all of a sudden you've got the um the summer of love in what, nineteen sixty nine, you've got like the whole hippie, I don't want to say um revolution, because revolutions are are planned. I think this was a rebellion and I think it was a rebellion created by, by the three letter agencies. My, my personal opinion that kind of brought people into this place of just being completely wackadoo in there and, and deranged in their perspective. And so it makes sense that in the seventies, you know, and that's the thing too, I think in today's age, like everything has this perfect time. We, we just don't, ooh, my light just flickered. We just don't, um, is that you, God? No, no, we just, we, we, uh, God, God's joined them. God, God's joined us, guys. Look, oh, the light just flickered. Um, you know, we, we are so used to seeing so many weird stuff that we don't really, not, not things that were sensational then aren't sensational to us anymore. And so I, I feel like we're desensitized yes. now. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Yes. But okay. we, we, and, and that's, that's intentional. Yeah. Price. Yeah. Okay. You look at